Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to our Marine Money Greater Bay Area Ship Finance Forum. Today's virtual conference will be presented in three distinct sessions, and we will hear from some of Hong Kong's leading ship owners, ship financiers, and executives who will share with us their thoughts on the latest shipping industry developments affecting Hong Kong, China's Greater Bay Area, and the world at large. For over 14 consecutive years, we have been hosting our annual Marine Money Hong Kong Conference, and we hope that towards the end of this year, we can return to Hong Kong to host our physical event as part of this year's Hong Kong Maritime Week. Taking full advantage of this virtual format, today's event will broaden the scope of the discussion to focus on the Greater Bay Area Initiative, its vision and implications for shipping and maritime service providers. For those of you listening in who may not yet be familiar with the concept of the Greater Bay Area, the Greater Bay Area was introduced in 2016 as part of China's 13th five-year plan and refers to the Chinese government's initiative to link the cities of Hong Kong, Macau, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Foshan, Zhongshan, Gongyuan, Huzhou, Jiangmen, and Chaoqing into an integrated economic and business hub. The Greater Bay Area is the largest and most populated urban area in the world and is among the fifth largest Bay Areas in the world, comparable to places like London, New York, San Francisco, and Tokyo. The Greater Bay Area has a combined regional GDP exceeding 1.6 trillion US dollars, which is equivalent to 12% of China's total economy and would alone be ranked as the 12th biggest economy in the world. According to a recent article published by the South China Morning Post, foreign direct investment in China grew at the fastest pace in more than a decade during the first quarter of 2021. Almost 10,000 new foreign invested companies were established in China during the first three months of this year alone. And there has also been a lot of demand from Bay Area customers wanting to invest outside China, which has led to outbound investments from greater Bay Area companies investing in places like Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and Thailand. Analysts expect double digit growth in the greater Bay Area. So from me, and hopefully this provides a, a very brief overview of the initiative and to tell us more about it, and especially how the initiative will affect shipping and trade in the coming years, I would like to kick off the first session of today's conference by inviting our panelists to please turn on their cameras and microphones to begin the first panel of the Greater Bay Area, Connecting Economies, um, Trade and Sustainability. Before we begin, I would like to remind the audience that you can um, ask your questions by typing them into the chat box in your control panel on the right of your screen, which you can see now. I will receive your questions and towards the end of the session, I will ask a select few to, to the panelists on behalf of the audience. It is now my great privilege to introduce to you the moderator of our opening panel discussion, Mr. Benjamin Wong, who is head of the Maritime Cluster at Invest Hong Kong. Invest Hong Kong has been our partner and supporter in Hong Kong and around the world for many years, and we value their support and their contribution to our conferences and to our business. Benjamin is sometimes referred to in the industry as the maritime face of Hong Kong, and his um, expertise combines maritime sector knowledge, economic development, international marketing, and investment promotion. Over the last few years, Benjamin has been responsible for attracting and facilitating foreign direct investment into the shipping industry in Hong Kong. So thank you very much, Benjamin, uh, for being with us today. And I will now hand over the microphone to you to kick off the discussion on the Greater Bay Area, connecting economies, trade and sustainability. Over to you, Benjamin. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, it's a uh, very kind words, and actually, um, it actually helps us um, to summarize actually very well uh, the Greater Bay Area concept. Uh, now, I think, um, of course, I need to uh, welcome all our panelists here first. Uh, here in Asia, also welcoming um, all the audience around the world. Um, probably it is um, uh, midnight in the Europe, and also uh, good evening to you in the, the Americas. Now, um, I think uh, for many, many, many years, actually, um, we have been talking about, say, Shenzhen in a uh, very competitive manner, uh, especially on the ports um, competition. Uh, however, with the Greater Bay Area, actually, this is a big 
paradigm shift because uh, now we are talking about cooperation, uh, not only with Shenzhen but also with um, all the other um, uh, all the other ten cities in the Greater Bay Area. Uh, of course, um, this actually is uh, very good in to to talk about competition. Um, sorry, uh, to talk about cooperation uh, rather than competition, uh, because obviously we have different strengths. Um, so for that uh, Greater Bay Area, of course, uh, the great, uh, the GDP is huge, uh, is uh, comparable to Australia and Spain, uh, and uh, it's got two stock markets in it. Uh, out of the top 10 container ports, we have three of those container ports here in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, here in Greater Bay Area, um, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and Hong Kong. Um, and uh, of course, uh, university-wise, actually, we have um, the top four universities uh, from the top 100. So um, it's a lot of um, activities and also actually a lot of uh, substance in it. Um, so actually, I would like to uh, listen to the panelists and um, uh, what Greater Bay Area could offer and how best we could um, do to reap the uh, benefits. Um, but besides that, actually another topic I would like, like to talk about is on the decarbonization. We have the IMO mentioned about the um, 5 billion US dollar fund um, for decarbonization. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, IMO, we have also the 2050 greenhouse gas emission um, uh, looming above our head. Uh, over here in Hong Kong, we have the 2050 net zero. Uh, China, we have um, 20, uh, uh, 2060 uh, also uh, carbon neutral. So we have all this uh, going on to the uh, sustainability. So it's going to be a big topic. So that would be covered here in this session also. Uh, now, uh, without further ado, I would like to start the panel. Um, I will go to Bjorn first uh, as the chairman of the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association, then obviously uh, representing a very important uh, segment. Uh, here in Hong Kong um, and also for the ship owners. Uh, now, um, beyond, um, for I mentioned about the uh, uh, Greater Bay Area, now we are in a cooperative manner, uh, whereas at the same time, we have, say, for example, um, the uh, uh, Yangtze River Delta area, uh, Shanghai, Ningbo, Zhaoshan, growing very fast, very strong. Um, they are also going through a unification process, actually, uh, same idea like um, Greater Bay Area here in um, uh, southern China. Uh, so uh, from your perspective, actually, is this competition or is there room for uh, cooperation? How best is actually for us over here uh, in Greater Bay Area in Hong Kong um, to do in order to develop our potential? Please be uh, thank you, Benjamin, and, and thank you very much to Marine Money for having me here today. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question, Benjamin. Um, obviously, the Greater Bay Area vision um, is, is a massive one, and, and so is the vision for the Yangtze River Delta. Um, I think in, in many ways, the two areas will be able to complement each other. Um, in in um, in the south around the Pearl River Delta, uh, as Andrew was saying, we have these 11 municipalities with uh, a population of about 70 million people living sort of within one hour of travel uh, from each other, um, with a GDP of 1.6 trillion, um, which is about 12% of China's GDP, despite the fact that the area is only 5%. Uh, of China's population. So you can see that it's already one of the more prosperous um, and developed areas of China. And, and the and division really is about creating a unified area where goods and people and ideas and funds uh, can flow frictionless between one part of that area to another. And through that, grow the economic pie for everyone. Um, I think Hong Kong being the designated shipping center of China and of the Greater Bay Area uh, comes with some unique strengths to contribute to that vision. Uh, Hong Kong has got a low and stable tax regime, um, especially in shipping. We've had the 23B for many years, which is, uh, is taxation for owning and operating ships and recently we've introduced uh, tax incentives for ship leasing out of Hong Kong as well. So a low and stable tax regime 
um, coupled with our open currency account and the Hong Kong dollar, which is uh, exchangeable and pegged to the US dollar, um, and our rule of law, um, the common law system that is transparent and predictable, and which helps to attract companies looking to China and looking to uh, to, to the East to, uh, to uh, establish themselves in this area. And I think that the Greater Bay Area vision will only augment Hong Kong's position as a as a doorstep to China uh, with a, if you will, much bigger hinterland um, and, and a much bigger Bay economy uh, being a dynamo mm -hmm. for the future development of, of the region. I think that the Greater Bay Area um, Pearl River economy uh, can very much complement the the development we see around the Yangtze River. Um, we are perhaps a, a bit further down the services economy in the south, whereas the the the, the Yangtze River economy is still very much based on on manufacturing uh, and production. Um, but I think I think that Hong Kong is well positioned in uh, in the Greater Bay Area, especially when it comes to our strengths in finance and in shipping, uh, to serve a much bigger economic um, powerhouse, which is what this Pearl River Delta economy would be. Mm. Thank you, Bill. Um, you mentioned about 23B and also um, Hong Kong being a finance center. Uh, so um, may I ask also a uh, follow-up question on, um, on that? Um, now, um, with um, the Hong Kong ship leasing uh, tax incentive, then uh, of course uh, is uh, drawing more um, ship less source coming into the city. Uh, and also I know that uh, for the Ship Owners Association, you are also starting to have uh, ship less source as your members. So um, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit more on how is this changing the landscape uh, in the um, shipping segment? Yeah, I mean, the financing model is changing these years uh, in shipping, right? and traditional uh, owner, um, uh, owner equity owned with debt financing still exists, but it's now there's now a growing pile uh, uh, of uh, lease finance, uh, and you've seen Hong Kong already have had significant success in an aircraft leasing uh, scheme and an aircraft leasing uh, tax incentive that's driven a big growth in that segment here in Hong Kong, and we now see you know the same kind of developments going on in shipping. Um, Obviously, the the last year and a half or so with the with the pandemic and 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 the, the difficulties in moving people in and out of uh, Hong Kong and across the border into mainland China and other places has put a little bit of a damper on the development of these of these things because we are all waiting for for the borders to uh, reopen and for physical travels uh, to our neighboring cities uh, to resume. But I'm sure that uh, we are on the cusp of of, of uh, getting getting there, uh, getting to a place where we can again uh, travel unimpeded to and from the Greater Bay Area. Thank you, thank you, Bjorn. Um, next, actually, I would like to move on to uh, Lian Jun, um, yeah. our uh, <laughs> a veteran in the uh, maritime uh, legal practice, uh, and also um, from mainland China actually I studied in UK, right, and uh, practiced here in Hong Kong for a long time. Uh, now, um, for uh, the 14th five-year plan of China, obviously, is um, com very comprehensive and covering all aspects of um, uh, uh, economic activities and different things. Um, now, um, it mentioned that um, it will uh, maintain Hong Kong as the trade, uh, finance, and also um, transportation uh, shipping hub. Um, and uh, for that, actually, of course, it includes also the legal side of it. Now, uh, Nanjun, I, I would like to ask, um, from what I gathered, uh, it seems like um, under the Greater Bay Area um, initiative, there is kind of like a, um, a green channel or fast track or a simpler process uh, for uh, legal, practitioner, legal practitioners 
in Hong Kong going into uh, Greater Bay Area to practice, uh, the process seems like it's much simpler. Uh, now, um, could you uh, brief us a little bit on um, the process and how it's simpler? Um, also, what's the uh, market potential uh, opportunities uh, of that for the um, uh, legal professions uh, from here in Hong Kong? Thank you. Um, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, good morning uh, to all the panelists and all the distinguished guests. Uh, firstly, I would, I would like to thank uh, Benjamin, you, Andrew, and Mary Money for your kind invitation to me for this uh, session. Um, as you mentioned, the 14 years plan is to support Hong Kong to enhance its status as international legal and the dispute resolution center in Asian Pacific region. Hong Kong legal professionals, uh, including um, 12,000 solicitors and 1,500 barristers, will play a very important role in this regard. As you know, uh, recent um, um, the investigation uh, published by a very well-known university in um, in London. Hong Kong is listed as one of the three most liked arbitration centers in the world, together with London and Singapore. As you know, also BIMCO chosen Hong Kong as one of the uh, built-in um, arbitration places. So recently, uh, there is one policy uh, which has been implemented to allow Hong Kong lawyers to become a lawyer practicing in GBA areas. If you have five years experience and you sit exam, so you can be qualified. This is really good news for the Hong Kong lawyers. As you know, Hong Kong lawyers are trained and, and uh, common law. This will certainly uh, provide an opportunity for foreign companies for more choices of their lawyers in GBA and the job opportunities for Hong Kong lawyers. And those uh, duly uh, dual qualified lawyers can certainly also bring their expertise to the GBA areas to bring the local lawyers, um, you know, into their services to work uh, market. In addition to this, uh, I would like to just update um, for the participant of the forum. The companies uh, established in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, established in Shenzhen, Shanghai areas, uh, including from Hong Kong, and you can choose Hong Kong law as governing law with your counterparts in China. And the current Chinese legal system. A Chinese company, if you have a contract with a Chinese company, you can't choose foreign law, including Hong Kong law. Now, um, it's allowed. If you set up a company in Shanghai, so you can choose Hong Kong law. That also uh, provides Hong Kong lawyers a great participation um, in the Great Bay areas. That also gave confidence of the foreign investors. They can choose um, Hong Kong law as governing law with their counterparts in China. It was not allowed, now it's permitted. So for both foreign investment companies and the Hong Kong lawyers will be, um, you know, benefit from this. Uh, and um, further in, in 19, 2019, the, if you have chosen one of the six Hong Kong arbitration institutions and um, only the uh, allowed from the Hong Kong point of view, you can apply, let's say, uh, for attachment, uh, freezing assets in mainland. That's the only jurisdiction allowed in mainland. So the Hong Kong lawyers and the duly qualified, uh, dual qualified Hong Kong lawyers will play an important role in that regard. And recently, and the Supreme People's Court and the Hong Kong Department of Justice has signed a memorandum to allow Hong Kong liquidators uh, recognized in the mainland. Shenzhen is one of the city. So again, for the dual qualified lawyers, they have a role to play. Um, 
so similarly, there are a lot of things going on. I understand from the uh, chief uh, justice of uh, sorry, chief um, department of justice. So there is a platform for mediation to be set up in the GBA, i.e., people in GBA you can choose this platform for dispute resolution by way of mediation. Hopefully, um, there are other platforms or coordination in terms of arbitration and even the court system, and we can work on that. So therefore, so this new regime uh, to give uh, Hong Kong lawyers uh, more opportunities to work in GBA and also uh, gave the foreign companies a confidence um, in their choice of lawyers and the choosing the law. I hope that's on update everyone. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you, thank you, Len Um That's actually very interesting uh, hearing about the implementation of the injury measures also. Obviously, uh, we believe it is a very strong um, addition to our arbitration uh, arena. And uh, Len Jin, actually, I would also like to ask a little bit on, because uh, we had another session uh, in, in another occasion on the change yeah. and up of the China Maritime Code. Now, yeah. uh, wondering uh, with this kind of interaction or increased in interaction between uh, Hong Kong, Greater Bay Area, mainland China, then um, is it uh, helping or how does it uh, affect the update of the uh, China Maritime Code? Okay, um, I'm one of the consultant uh, who has participated in the revision of the Maritime Code. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have adopted most uh, latest international conventions such as limitation. However, in mainland, uh, the Maritime Code was adopted in 1992. That's already about 40 years now. So the revision to the Maritime Code is to update the legal regime uh, in line with the international conventions. If the revisions are passed, it's more uh, in line with Hong Kong. So I think um, uh, on the limitation on the maritime law unification, that's a good way to develop. And uh, so basically, um, GB, uh, GBA areas in Hong Kong, you have more close uh, cooperation because the substantive laws are going to be similar. Yes. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Nigerian. Thank uh, now, I would like to uh, move on to Captain Joe. Um, Kevin Joe, actually, this will be a two-part question. Uh, first part actually uh, is um, on your setup in Tianhai, um, the free trade zone over there in Shenzhen. Um, I believe um, that that is mainly for crewing, and uh, I would like to ask um, how is it working out for uh, Wak Wong? And um, with this, um, you see uh, um, how how is the Greater Bay Area? Uh, initiative uh, increasing the um, mobility connectivity um, within the area helping Wakwa. And then the second um, question is actually on the um, carbon credit partnership with China Light and Power, the Hong Kong uh, electricity company, uh, because um, I believe uh, with that you do some uh, carbon uh, credit trading uh, with them uh, to offset uh, the uh, carbon emission uh, from your operation. Uh, obviously, um, that uh, relates to sustainability and also a much longer uh, commitment to the uh, Green Initiative. So, uh, could you also comment and brief us a little bit on the, uh, what you are doing uh, with this partnership and uh, what's the uh, longer term uh, vision uh, of Wa Kuang on this? Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Good morning uh, to the other panelists and uh, good morning to the audience. Also, uh, many thanks to the Ambarian Money to invite me to join this uh, uh, panel. Yes, uh, uh, to answer the Ben's question, yes, we uh, established the uh, uh, first uh, the, 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 the branch company outside Hong Kong in Qianghai area in the early 2020. So the, the purpose is not only uh, for the crewing part, uh, but also for the more marine talents for the short post, short job as well. So as uh, Bjorn mentioned, the, the Great Bay Area, Great Bay uh, Initiative, that the main objective is to ensure that the free flow of the resources uh, within the, this uh, region 
and uh, to leverage uh, respect advantages in the region. So everybody know that Hong Kong is a, a very uh, established maritime center for many, many years. But the current problem is that uh, we don't have uh, so many young people join industry. Hong Kong have a, it, it is a fourth uh, shipping logistics in the world. We have, uh, I think, uh, almost 800 shipping related uh, uh, companies in the Hong Kong. So we have a uh, rich uh, experienced people for the senior people, but we don't have so many young people to join. That is a, a issue and a challenge for the Hong Kong. However, the, the, after we, if we cross the board to the China side, then we have a big pool of the, the potential marine talents. We have a, China is the biggest the, the crew, a safest uh, nation in the world. Well, and uh, with the, the point, uh, I think it's about the point seven million uh, seafarers, including the, uh, of course, including the, the, the local river, uh, that this cruise. So we have a bigger resource, much bigger resources in the Great Bay areas. Because of the Great Bay area initiatives and the government already built up a lot of uh, cross-boundary infrastructure, including Macau, uh, the, 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 the railway, express railway, including the bridge, and uh, including so many uh, the control stations. So make it it's very easy, very convenient for people to move in and out. In addition, central government also issued, I think several years ago, issued uh, many facilitation policies to facilitate the Hong Kong people working in the gravel area, and basically they can enjoy a very equivalent benefit as a local people. In the meantime, local government in the gravel area also announced the issue that many, many facilitated measures to allow the Hong Kong city people working in the gravel area, they can enjoy equivalent tax at the Hong Kong, and they, they, they can uh, have the very easier to solve their children, to schooling, uh, et cetera. All these uh, the facility measures make it possible for people in and out Hong Kong to and uh, grab areas. After we establish, why we established our branch of the inner Shanghai. So our, our plan is that Shanghai is so close to company, uh, so, so, so Hong Kong, Although last year, because of pandemic, it is uh, restricted for traveling. But uh, if in the normal days, we plan, we have uh, our senior staffs sitting in the grave area for some time, but for training local staffs. And uh, local young staff, they also can, from time to time, come to our city, our head office in uh, Hong Kong to receive trainings. But these uh, people exchange, a sick, sick comment, we can help to train uh, staffs from Great Bay Area to support our shipping activities in the Hong Kong. And uh, actually, we found it is quite a success. And although the uh, pandemic uh, prevented us to uh, in and out, but uh, in the last year, actually, we moved uh, uh, 10 experienced uh, Hong Kong staff, senior staff, to our center in Chiang Kai office to help him set up uh, this company and help training local staff and we, during the last one year, we recruited 25 people locally, including 10 marine superintendent and uh, technical superintendent, plus uh, uh, supporting staffs. And it, it, we found it works very well. Of course, this is a, for, for, for bringing the more, training up more uh, talents to support the officer functions. In addition, and uh, Waguang, also, very actively working with the uh, major shipping companies uh, in Hong Kong to promote establishing a maritime business school in the Shenzhen uh, uh, Great Bay area uh, to train the seafarers. So that school is uh, very much focused on uh, practical uh, ability training. Also, we will also focus on the programs to bridge this seafarers to become transition to a, a senior 
short positions like uh, such as marine superintendent, technical superintendent, and uh, even the uh, manager level. As, as you know, we in the area we actually we have a uh, in the Korea we have a very rich shipping resources. We have the biggest uh, uh, bike company, the Costco bike. They are in Guangzhou. We have the biggest uh, VACC and VACC, uh, VACC and VOC fleet, China Motion in Hong Kong. We have biggest uh, the ship managers in Hong Kong. So many uh, great resources. So we can use utilize these resources to 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 train these uh, uh, staffs, and we can. If this business was set in the uh, Great Bay area, and just shipping company, the senior executives, they can easily to access that school to give lectures, to 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 give the, uh, to train up those uh, uh, talents to support uh, shipping in the area, including Hong Kong, including Great Bay areas. So that is uh, some briefing update uh, about uh, that uh, training part. So on um, you are the second question regarding the uh, carbon credit offset. Yes, Wakon signed uh, the strategy uh, cooperation agreement with CLP last year and uh, to buy in the carbon credit for three years to offset our carbon footprint. So basically, it covers a uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three uh, of settings. So we see in the future for for credible area, it, it is actually is a, a, a bigger potential, and uh, each side uh, to do more this type of uh, uh, the uh, 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 tradings. Uh, as you have mentioned at the beginning, China announced uh, 2060, they are aimed for the carbon neutral, and uh, Hong Kong government uh, is aiming for the uh, carbon neutral by 2025. So, actually, it is a very challenging job, actually. It need a lot of uh, investment, a lot of the uh, technology uh, uh, the, the development, so I, I can see the grab area is a, a, a very good platform actually. So can integrate with resources, connect the money in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a traditional maritime finance center, a traditional finance center. Uh, money can easily in and out of the open market, China and uh, have a big market. So this is the, I think is good uh, potential. We can use utilize the grab area platform to further help uh, local companies to achieve this carbon carbon neutral to, to reduce carbon emission uh, during the transition to the low carbon world. Thank you, that is a uh, sharing from my side. Thank you, Captain Zhou. Um, especially uh, on these two issues, I think they're actually kind of uh, interlinked uh, because um, for the talent um, development, um, as Captain Zhou mentioned, um, it seems like it is not as easy to attract a young talent into the industry. Uh, I think um, actually it has something to do also with um, uh, uh, when people see ships uh, on the ocean or in the harbor, uh, if the ship is just sailing along um, uh, with nothing happens, then actually people don't remember that. But then if a vessel is passing through with black, uh, with black smokes, uh, dark smokes, then actually people will remember that. And I think it is kind of like a, a mist stereotyping uh, of ships. Um, so I believe um, this, um, this actually is also coming out from the misunderstanding of the industry, uh, not knowing uh, the technology which is behind the ship and all that, uh, and also the management of it. Um, so actually, I think uh, with um, the uh, uh, bringing up the awareness and also especially on the green front, uh, this would be very useful. Um, now, uh, 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 then I'm coming to Jenny. Uh, I'm saving the best for the last uh, obviously, Jenny's got a, uh, a new face in, uh, I think, in the shipping arena. And uh, so, for, uh, Jenny, actually, um, before um, you answer my questions, actually, uh, could you please uh, use a couple minutes to, um, uh, to introduce Carbon Base uh, so that people uh, or audience would understand where you're coming out from? And um, on my question, actually, um, as I mentioned, it seems like uh, people usually associate um, the uh, pollution with uh, uh, commercial shipping. So um, this actually, uh, I would like to know um, 
what it is some um, carbon based uh, a tech enabled uh, company uh, bringing to the shipping on the sustainability front and uh, also what kind of opportunity and challenges that you are seeing out from the Greater Bay Area please. Thank you so much uh, Benjamin, Andrew and Marine Money for having me here really Honored to be part of this distinguished panel with all the shipping veterans here. Um, so, just to answer your question, it's a very loaded question. Uh, we could go on hours just on that topic um, in a couple of parts. So, first, first part is a uh, quick background on you know myself and Carbon Base and how we came to be involved in the shipping conversation. Um, so, before Carbon Base, I come from six years at Deloitte M&A, uh, managing transactions mostly in the technology and logistics se sectors. So I've been really fascinated by the marine time, um, the maritime industry for moving literally the entire world around so efficiently, um, especially during the pandemic last year when you know all other methods of transportation was, was virtually shut down. So my company at Carbon Base, where I'm now um, the product manager of, is a actually a climate tech company founded in Hong Kong. Uh, with a global team in China, North America, uh, and Europe. So our vision is really to build technology tools that incentivize companies and individuals to reduce carbon emissions. And to, I know Captain Joe's sharing had a perfect segue. Um, we had the honor of helping Huaquan measure their carbon footprint for um, our offset with the CLP and to become the first carbon neutral ship owner in Hong Kong. And um, so our enterprise carbon management software is um, tailored specifically for the shipping industry to help measure as well as to communicate the carbon emission data up and down the supply chain. Because you know, from our view, shipping emission, just like you said, you know, people see the black smokes, but people emission is, is not the responsibility of just the owners, it's the responsibility of really the entire supply chain. Um, and you know, so we also want to be able to connect ship financing data for the audience here um, of Marine Money uh, with, and they have the ship financing data has needs, which matches perfectly with the operation emission data supply, so that we can facilitate more sustainable investments against this large ticking clock of climate change. So you know, that's a bit background on carbon base. And you know, to your question, um, what you know, how can a tech uh, driven company like Carbon Base bring to the shipping industry um, decarbonization. Any industry, you know, shipping industry uh, especially, is is really not an easy feat, and it takes coordination and value alignment between I think, operators, financiers, and policymakers, among you know, many many other stakeholders. So, especially for the audience here, you know, I think we're all kind of number driven people. Um, so you know, data, I think, really is the best common language that everyone speaks. So therefore, by connecting this data from ship owners to charters to banks to regulatory bodies, you know, these data already exist, but they often exist in silos or they exist in different formats. So what we can do is to help facilitate these value alignments and connect sustainable projects in decarbonization of shipping to sustainable funding so that they can happen quicker and at a much larger scale. And the last part of the question on the opportunity and challenges um, for, for decarbonization in shipping, this whole clean, clean energy evolution, I think shipping is really, really an interesting um, industry because it sits in the middle between, you know, the sort of the fossil, the fossil fuel industry on the upstream and the global, entire global supply chain downstream. So I think decarbonization of shipping is a key to gear to turn in order to sort of speed up all these other changes up and down this, the chain. So where I, I think that's where the opportunity is. And it's, you know, it's amazing that maritime shipping, you know, even though shipping contributes 2% of around overall global emissions, but it literally moves 90% of the goods around. Um, so we li I definitely like to bring that awareness to the entire supply chain, you know, on the challenge side, um, as you mentioned before, the IMO sets the decarbonization goal to reduce the average carbon intensity of ships by 40% by 2030. But these, you know, these are million dollar assets that last 25 years. So the engineer finance and policy side really need to work together to scale up solutions and accelerate this transition schedule. 
So I think that's the challenge side, but the opportunity side, I think, will also reward those who take action early, right? So we're seeing more and more these green shipping loans from the largest financiers you know, reinforced by frameworks like Poseidon principles to you know green fees um, for for you know for green ships and a growing number of ports. Um, and I think you know the the investors into the sector could really use some help from more updated and transparent data sources to help navigate these opportunities and you know how can we figure out the best ROI not only for for the portfolios uh, for the shipping portfolios as well as for you know, our planet as a whole so that's you know that's where I see and I think there's a special benefit of addressing these opportunities and challenges from Hong Kong um, Hong Kong I think is a very special place to to serve this role uh, because it already has a key global financial center and a key, you know, global shipping port. Plus, you know, the the government basically officially announced that you know we're going to become the green financing hub in the region. There's hundred billion dollars of green bond issuance program already out here. I think since uh, 2019, and plus our um, proximity to the largest carbon market in China, which is actually in Guangzhou. Um, there's, there's, you know, in our opinion, there's simply no better place and timing for us to be kind of right here, right now, working on this together with everyone here. So I'm really excited. So I'm really excited to be here to have this conversation with everyone. So thank you, Benjamin, for the question. Thank you, Jenny. Um, you mentioned something about the Guangzhou um, uh, carbon market, and I've got some statistics over here on the Guangzhou Carbon Emission Exchange. Um, it is released earlier this year in March. So the cumulative transaction volume of carbon emission quota in the Guangdong province was 175 million tons. Uh, for this uh, amount, actually, it, uh, account, it accounts for about 38% uh, of the national uh, pilot carbon trading scheme. Um, ranking actually the first in the country. Uh, now uh, the cumulative uh, transaction volume was uh, 3.6 billion yuan, uh, renminbi, accounting for 34% of the national carbon uh, emission. Now um, this actually is quite a uh, an impressive figure uh, for the Guangzhou uh, carbon exchange. Um, now actually I would like to um, ask um, the uh, I would like to open up the floor actually um, to all the panelists on um, your view on how best it is um, to make use of um, this uh, coming emission exchange, uh, because obviously um, this is also the main drive within China um, and also for the Greater Bay Area. It is something that we believe that um, Hong Kong actually we are very good on the uh, financial market with platform trading. And uh, is there something that um, Hong Kong and also um, uh, the uh, Guangzhou Common Emission Exchange have could collaborate together? Um, maybe Jenny, since you were talking about it, maybe I'll start with you. Sure, sure. So um, again, I, like I mentioned, I think the opportunity here really, really is phenomenal. So with China and Hong Kong's carbon neutral goals pretty much carved in stone and announced, you know, in 2060 and 2050 respectively, um, the increasing of the price of every ton of emission um, for everybody really is is only a question of when and not really if. So if you look at the compliance market price in um, in Beijing is already over uh, 15 US and you know in Europe that number is more like 30. Um, so you know a volunteer market will only converge to that um, due to the crossover allowance to allow companies to use some of that um, to satisfy their compliance requirements. So from you know from a sort of cost mitigation perspective, I think one opportunity there is the the first movers can really get in and mitigate some of this inflationary pressure with you know long term relationships with reputable suppliers of these um, carbon markets. So so that's one. And you know I was and the second one is I was reading um, uh, uh, proposals that was sent out by uh, Dr. Ma Jun who's leading the Hong Kong Green Finance Association. So there are also policy proposals of actually joining forces with the, um, uh, with the carbon markets of Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau, so that it, it greatly amplifies the market and also will be able to provide better liquidity as a result for everyone else. So that's, that's another aspect of it. Um, and I think another really interesting thing is the, 
national carbon market will not only allow you know, shipping businesses to purchase credits to offset its emissions you know, as, as a buyer, but there are actually policy in the works to allow sustainability forward businesses, you know, say alternative fuel, um, to create carbon um, credit supply for, for the good work that they're doing ahead of sort of the rest of the industry, uh, which creates a potential revenue stream actually for uh, companies who participate. And, you know, interestingly, that's, that's literally how Tesla is profitable. Like it's the only reason why they're profitable because if they're selling car um, EV credits to other car companies that just don't have it. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's also a very interesting um, tactic that to, you know, to, to further differentiate the the forward moving shipping companies away from you know the sort of lagging peers in addition to enjoining these lower financing costs brought more by policies by banks um, so that's that whole financial and revenue side is really interesting uh, but you know any of these participations will require companies to go through what's called the MRV process so monitoring reporting and verification of um, whether you're, you know, whether it's your emissions, whether it's um, that you're actually creating credits for the good work that you're doing, and this this whole MRV process and sector, which currently is still on average quite manual and inefficient process, um, and the, the, which affects communication between stakeholders. So I think this is where adapting, uh, where we want to push more technology into the carbon management space as early as possible um, and it can help you know companies to better position themselves when these carbon related challenge and opportunities is is only coming kind of going um, going to come in waves in in the near future so i think those are those are uh, really exciting things to look at mm. thank you thank you jenny i think the uh, mrv segment actually uh, probably will be a very active segment uh, in the next many decades um, now uh, you also mentioned about the use of uh, alternative fuel uh, and uh, i think actually it's very interesting because um, uh, uh, we had another session the other day and uh, uh, it seems like there, there were uh, we we've got a poll on the on the alternative fuel so including lng uh, ammonia hydrogen uh, even nuclear uh, or electric uh, obvious the uh, nuclear, nuclear electric is um, at the bottom uh, either because of the capacity of the battery or the safety um, uh, stringent requirement on nuclear uh, but then LNG actually uh, uh, is the most popular uh, pick uh, but uh, but then on this alternative field actually I would like to um, sidetrack a little bit and ask uh, Bjorn because I know he is uh, very passionate on this topic um, what's your view um, on that uh, for the shipping industry um, to achieve IMO 2050 uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, what would be your best bet? Thanks, Benjamin. Um, yeah, well, well as, as Jenny said, right, sh shipping moves 80 to 90% of everything, right? Um, so it's actually a, an extremely um, clean industry already. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. we emit more, just over 2% of, of uh, all global emissions, um, but we move 90% of, of, of goods uh, across the globe. Um, and because shipping is such a big industry, um, we, we still emit something to the tune of 1 billion tons of CO2 uh, per year. So we got to find a way to decarbonize uh, shipping as well. And shipping is special because other industries you can, you can last decarbonize through through the grid as you move into renewables or nuclear then that's not possible for shipping because ships are off grid by definition and have to uh, have today to burn uh, burn fossil fuels to be able to move these goods around so in shipping we are looking at what what uh, alternative fuels can be used to replace the fossil fuels and um, i think that um, you know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, batteries as a store of energy, but, but it's really not efficient enough for, for shipping. So I think we're, we're moving towards a world where it's stuff like ammonia, uh, methanol, biodiesel, or perhaps synthetic uh, green diesel um, mm -hmm. that will become prevalent uh, fuels of the future. Now the challenge we have is that all those fuels are expensive to produce, uh, an order of magnitude more expensive than, than 
uh, pumping fossil fuels out of out of the underground and using that. So we are moving towards a world whereby you will see um, either emissions trading schemes or levies, taxes on carbon emissions, which can then be offset to incentivize some of these new green fuels. And you will then create a level playing field whereby ship owners can invest uh, in technologies that will enable the burning of these green fuels. Um, there are, you know, that there are opportunities in in the space that Jenny talks about, also for sh also for shipping. Um, one thing is is certain, or seems certain, that is that carbon credits will only become more expensive in the decade ahead. So uh, so you know that's something for perhaps for um, for um, ship owners uh, to think about is how to to hedge their investments in shipping through uh, perhaps uh, participation in in uh, in carbon credit um, vehicles that could be uh, financing vehicles for creating carbon credits uh, for offsets etc uh, which would which would be a good a good hedge in terms of some of these developments we see whereby um, the cost of carbon emission also in shipping is only going to go up in the next decade or so the other thing to say is, yes, we have the, the 2018 uh, articulated level of ambition by IMO saying, you know, by 2030, we need to reduce by 40% on a per ton mile basis. By 2050, we need to reduce by 50% on an absolute basis relative to 2008, and then phase out emissions completely uh, before the end of the century. That, that's the, the stated ambition level from 2018. But I think you can already now see that that ambition level is going to be tightened up. It's going to become more aggressive just in the next couple of years. I mean, that's still a long way to 2030 and a much longer way to 2050. And I think uh, shipping is uh, is well served by by reading the writing on the wall, which will probably mean that by 2050 we have to be carbon neutral, and by 2030. We probably have to be 50% better than we are today. So it's it's only uh, an accelerating journey that we're on here, and uh, there are many challenges, but also many opportunities for shipping in that in that uh, space. And I think, you know, with with again with Hong Kong being where we are, with the companies and the universities we have here, and then with the Greater Bay Area um, powerhouse behind us and all the innovation that's taking place there. I think Pearl River Delta could play a very significant role, especially in Asia, around this decarbonization journey. And, and again, Hong Kong is, is uh, superbly located to be a partner and a, and a participant in this development. Mm. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, yes, um, there is always an uh, argument on the what's best um, alternative fuel. And uh, I was talking with some bus uh, people um, so uh, some are actually saying electricity, uh, battery, whereas uh, some others are talking about hydrogen. So uh, always a debate on that. Uh, now, uh, my last question, actually, I think I've got about um, seven, eight minutes or six minutes um, on that. Now, um, earlier, it was also talking about uh, the alternative fuel uh, for carbon uh, emission, uh, the, 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 the quota. Now, um, ESG is also something which is uh, very often talked about now. and um, uh, it seems like also the regulators also looking at how best uh, to in incorporate the disclosure of that and also how to make use of them. And uh, obviously, uh, the discussion also mentioned about the lower uh, financing cost. Um, so ESG actually probably would be something which would help uh, to lower the financing cost. Um, so um, I would like to ask um, the panelists, uh, also open the floor. Um, what is your experience in the use of uh, ESG on this? Uh, and um, uh, obviously, we believe that uh, Hong Kong, uh, with uh, uh, the very strong financing sector and also the consulting side of it, um, we would have a, an edge on it. Uh, but then in the Greater Bay Area, how could we uh, work that out together? Uh, maybe uh, I'll start with Nanjin uh, this time. Yeah, yes, um, uh, my, uh, frankly, myself has not been deeply involved, but my colleagues in the energy, oh, energy uh, resource side, they have been working on this, and um, um, this is um, an opportunity. And uh, hopefully, 
um, it can be done, and um, in particular the cost. So that's uh, my, my as I said, the personally I was not involved, but but my colleagues in that in the energy side they do um, a lot of discussions. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that's my uh, contribution. I don't have much contribution okay. on that. Thank you. Um, then uh, other panelists, um, what about Jenny? Um, what's your experience, or have you helped uh, other companies? A carbon base I have. Uh, has um, carbon base helped other companies in terms of um, working out the ESG, the disclosure, and the information on it? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, through through our work with clients, we we can really see that you know on the carbon emission disclosure alone, so right, you know, the E E out of the ESG, uh, we're definitely seeing more Hong Kong and GBA banks. You know, DBS being an example, they're pushing out more emission linked financing products. So there are real profit drivers in you know making these disclosures accurately and also efficiently tracked, so that you know there's sort of less um, there's there's more transparency and less audit and all these MRV work um, going into it. And you know I think ESG and you know, Hong Kong Exchange for a while has been you know requiring 100% of their issuers to disclose. Uh, ESG metrics such as carbon emission. So it's really becoming just like the financial disclosures that everyone is already used to that, you know, it's no longer, I think before it's sort of seen as this appendix, you know, in your any report that you kind of outsource to your consultants and don't really worry about it. Um, but it's really becoming, you know, this floodgate to access to financing and access to markets, um, access, you know, potential customers for those that are closer to that um, end of the supply chain. So, you know, therefore, I, I really think it should be part of the, the, the ESG measuring and disclosing strategy should really become part of the core management and data strategy in any business, um, not just in shipping. And that's, you know, that's, that's part of the reason why we've, we've been just swamped with, with people asking us, you know, how do you, how do you do it? Can you help us do it? Um, and we try to do it with technology because it's it's much more scalable than kind of the traditional um, consulting um, method where you know you sort of answer a question or you 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 provide an answer when someone asks you a question. But but by digitizing these data, you can really then apply the value of these ESG data that you know you're already tracking within the business, but you're really digging the value out of these data to satisfy requirements from regulatory, from financing, from your board, from your customers. Um, so that's it's really more efficient for everyone. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Um, I think we've got. Um, Maybe I can say. Yeah. Yes, Kevin, oh, please. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I can add that um, yes, uh, actually I can share the experience for our own companies and uh, as uh, I mentioned, as you also mentioned, you know, we, we the uh, last year we, we signed an agreement with the CLP to offset our carbon footprint, including our own ships uh, bunkering and including the traveling for the executive, including crewing, traveling, etc. But uh, we are actually last year not only doing this, this is only part of them. And we are also doing some other uh, measures and including the social uh, supporting the educations and other initiatives. Basically, it's in the work one, we, we uh, developed a first ESG policies in during the 2020s. And, uh, and this is, has been, part of it has been audited by the, uh, by the, the certified professional companies on the, on the carbon side that, the journey and the carbon base has helped us and uh, because we have the uh, ESG initiatives and uh, we have done a first I think in Hong Kong is the first uh, uh, sustainability loan with the SHBC is uh, in there or in their bank is the first one and awarded to us for one of the uh, ship I would say ESG basically yes it will cost the money but I would say it's a good investment for ESG because by doing ESG, you can uh, improve your reputations, and uh, by the supporting, caring your staffs, your your the the, the staffs uh, uh, satisfaction is improved, and uh, hopefully also your business performance will be improved. So we will this is a, a good uh, investment, and uh, we will continue doing this. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you, Kevin Joe. It's, good. it's great to see um, ship owners, ship management company having such a big commitment on the sustainability. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> I think our time is up, uh, but I still want to make two uh, comments. Uh, one is uh, on the seafarers. Uh, it is not exactly related to the Greater Bay Area topic, but I believe um, the shipping industry would like um, to raise the awareness of uh, the seafarers. So Neptune Declaration and all that, uh, I hope that uh, people will be focusing a bit more on how important seafarers are. Um, the next thing, actually, very quickly, is that I would like to take a, a mini poll from our panelists on the whether you have been vaccinated, <laughs> either with mm -hmm. uh, one or two jabs. Um, so <clears throat> I see Jenny's got two hands up, so two jabs, um, two jabs, two jabs. Uh, Kevin Joe, two jabs, mm -hmm. same for me. So uh, it's 100% here. So uh, if we go along like this, um, I believe um, the travel restriction will be lifted very soon. Um, now I'll hand back the stage to um, Andrew, but before I, I, I do that, a big thanks to the panelists. And um, Andrew, please. Thank you very thank much. You very much uh, Benjamin, thank you. and uh, thank, you all, thank you all for being with us today and, and sharing your insights this morning. Great discussion. Uh, we have been running uh, about 20 minutes over time, which just goes to show you know, the, the interest in, in the discussion. Uh, but we don't have time for questions. So thank you very much for being here today. 